check it. So we'll water it again. Just a strip that uh, we filled in later with a planter because it got washed out in a bottom. So it was pretty green, but we'll run it through the machine. It's just a 12 row strip. We're on a pivot going up some hills. The reason why we picked this pivot is it's showing some uh, dryness and in the bottoms it's really nice and green but on the hillsides it's really turned brown and uh, some of the ears are starting to drop so this one might be susceptible to uh, getting blue over later. Stock quality possibly, keyword possibly. It's standing fine now but um, I don't know we just noticed that a nice fair, well not, not a nice but a a big contrast and variability from the bottoms to the top so uh, we thought if this one gets you know some high winds come in or something later on uh, you know it might get blown over while we're waiting on a truck uh, I'll kind of show you some things on our corn head here so as I mentioned before hopefully this doesn't crack out since it's kind of windy today so right here is what we call snapping rolls or stock rolls. Um, there's different kinds. You got your standard dealers. Deers actually got like three or four kinds out now. Um, 360 has a chain roll, yield 360 has a chain roll, but these are Comer uh, intermeshing stock rolls. And uh, we actually put these on before last year. And we've had them on our prior heads before, so we ran one set on our last uh, corn heads and then we put a new set when we bought these uh, used heads last year. What that does is it really explodes these tops and it kind of wicks in a little more moisture. I don't know, that might be splitting hairs there literally, but what it also does is it breaks up that stuff that goes in there and the almost confetti-like. And that's the term they like to use too is confetti. But it's really helped us in our breakdown of our our residue. I'm gonna get back in the cab here to kind of explain this since it's kind of breezy out here. My camp, sometimes my mic cracks. No, but what that does is it breaks down that BT residue, which um, since they started making GMO corn, it's really made that stock strength and, and a lot more rigorous. Um, it's been able to stand longer. It's uh, able to take the environment better uh, just all around has been a plus um, the only setback is when you go over winter and stuff it, it creates a lot more residue and you kind of got to manage it to have the right balance of residue you don't want to have too much that it's trashy and, and hard to plant into conditions especially in our lower till strip till but you don't want to take it all away where you don't have nothing but bare dirt so there's kind of a balance and we found leaving the stock standing over winter not doing any tillage over winter um, out here in nebraska anyway uh, it just kind of allows us to catch some of that snow maybe and and preserve that soil anyway and so that's kind of what we've done to utilize the balance of breaking down and keeping that night's uh trash um, equalization bit you got there buddy yeah who made it for you Who's over in that combine? Tom. Tom. Who did we say was in the cart? Dan? Dan. Dan's in the cart. Looks like we're gonna have to stop for him, huh? What? Looks like we're gonna have to wait on him, huh? Let them get their stuff together. Kind of something we got to contend with in our hills here. Especially this year, we've had a lot of these washouts. Yeah. Alright, eat mine. You better hurry up and eat that. I'll rip it out of your hand. <laughs> so 
So I told Dan, the green car driver, to come over here so I can still dump and unload on the go because it's more level. That's something you kind of got to communicate with and uh, basically talk back and forth through on the radios to tell them where we want them to be and and whatever. But because uh, every farmer knows there's always that uh, struggle between the uh, green car driver and the combine operator. buddy. Another thing too is when this corn's wetter we're picking some 26% uh, corn, 27% corn right now. That wetter corn, you can pile it up higher in the cart because it won't tend to slosh. Now, when we get down to, you know, 18 to 15 percent corn or whatever it actually gets dried down to, usually what we're harvesting at, it'll become more like water and kind of slosh around easier. So we won't fill them quite as high, but the weight will still be the same because just holding more water in there. So Dan leaving the cart that's over down the hill in front of the combine. And Grandpa's coming over there. He'll pick up Tom first. So we run typically two combines and two 1100 brace bushel grain cards. Um, what that allows us to do is we always try to be filling one cart while the other cart's out dumping at the truck or wherever it needs to be dumping. That way, sometimes when you're filling both at the same time, Sometimes you'll see those epic uh, combine displays and they'll be running side by side, all the carts are out there. But really, we like to be having one at the road dumping, one in the field filling. And the reason for that is if they both get full at the same time, we're usually waiting uh, for them to get back then. So when we got, just basically keeping it like clockwork, one's dumping while one's filling. And what really helps that process is one cart fills a semi, so that cart doesn't have to come back and get more corn. Uh, it just able just to keep flowing and that truck's leaving. And so we try to keep that flowing efficiently as it can. So as you'll see, a lot of these carts now are kind of in that 11 to 1300 bushel cart range because that really hits that niche of what that truck can hold. And so, yeah, that's kind of how that rolls out anyway. thing we've done is about three years ago we had a tractor get vandalized during harvest. They, they cut the power harness to the battery cables and, and they took all the batteries out of a tractor. They also took rear lights out of a tractor which I don't know what the street value is of that stuff but uh, can't be very high unless they're using it for something else which could very well be. But we placed these kind of around some of our equipment. This one's located here. I'm not going to show you all the other ones just so you know, don't know where they're at, but. No, they're, they're cellular game cameras, so uh, if they detect motion, uh, they'll send a picture to us to our phones just so we can kind of maybe have a chance of catching the next person if they ever try to do it again, so. Stuff to keep in mind. One thing when we're uh, hauling into a, a wet feed lot and uh, makes the most difference is corn is actually um, shrunk down to dry bushels, meaning just because we're, they're wet bushels doesn't mean we're getting paid for that extra weight of the water and the corn. They'll actually use a shrink factor um, to, to uh, get it down to the actual dry bushels. And what I mean by that is we're picking 27% 20, uh, corn right now, 26, 27. And uh, what they'll do is when you haul it in, so it's not a simple 56,000 pound load divided by 56 uh, pound test weight equals, you know, a thousand bushel. What you gotta do is take that 27% and minus 
15 percent and that's the difference that you dry to you you basically calculate dry bushels at 15 to 15 and a half percent depending on the elevator or situation you use so what they do is that 12 point discrepancy you take that times a factor and what i use is 1.18 percent and that's a that's roughly a 15 percent shriek factor so we'll take uh, that 12 point discrepancy times that 1.18 and you basically you minus that divided by 100. Anyway, I'm not gonna try to figure that. I, I can figure it out, I, I just can't tell it to you very well. I'm not a very good teacher, but long story short, you take that out and you figure it'll make like 85% of the load you haul in. So you take that 1,000 bushel and it actually turns it into about an 850 bushel load that you actually hauled in. But So that's kind of how uh, hauling in wet corn works. It's not a, as big a, I've got a little row that kind of jammed up on me here. That's a row clutch. Squirrel. But that's a, sometimes when the sweat stuff first getting started, it'll, an ear will get lodged in there and jam a row and the slip clutch will turn. But anyway, getting back to the, the test, or the, not the test weight, the, the shrunk bushels, that's how you'll do that anyway. So you're not actually getting paid just by pounds, you're getting paid by that bushel that you brought in. So one thing we do while we're loading on the go uh, on our farm is we'll tell the car drivers to go a set speed. And so right now we're on wet corn, so uh, we just kind of want to take it slow when we're moving around on it. So we'll tell them to sit. Right now I'm telling them to go two and a half. That allows me to freely go back and forth over the cart and to put it exactly where I want to fill it up. Because if he goes the same speed, if he maintains the same speed I always am, then I, it's hard on these longer carts to swing your auger back and forth. Also, those of you wondering, this is a pivot irrigated field on these hills over here. And we do plant end rows on our pivots. We plant about 24 end rows. Uh, the neighbor over there, he'll plant, he's got a 24 row planter, so uh, he'll plant 48, just so he has plenty of room to turn around with that big planter. So it just depends on the farm, what kind of planters they got, but 24 rows is enough for our little dinky planters to turn around. If you can also tell, this is a dry land pivot corner. We call what doesn't get irrigated dry land out here in Nebraska at least. I'm sure other locations do as well. But typically we plan on, you know, it producing about 60% on our farm anyway, what it uh, will do on the irrigated. So we'll actually drop our population way down and maybe plan only, you know, 17 to 20,000 because we've had years where it's been so dry, nothing's really grown. That being the extreme, and then some years like this year, we could have planted near irrigated uh, stands, which is, usually runs about 33,000. You know, just depending on the hybrid, we planted up to 35 to 36. We do usually don't plant that high, but um, just depending on the hybrid. But yeah, usually our dry land we plant about 17, maybe 20,000 if it's in a bottom area. So that's kind of what we do on our farm out here in uh, central Nebraska. We just figure on it being a, a, a less uh, opportunity for yield anyway. So you know how like Welkers had awesome epic names for their combines like Optimus Bind and it's starting to rain on my parade. Sprinkling them. Or Beast Bind. Well, I gotta come up with a name for mine. I think I'll call it Margaret. First I'll have to explain to my wife. I've been hanging out with Margaret all day. Still worth the risk. If this doesn't remind me of spring planting 2019 this year, you just get these little squalls come through, sprinkle on your equipment, and then you do a little work and it just makes it dirtier and crap, so. I don't know. We're waiting on trucks right now. Which is about 50% of the wheat that gets imported in Japan comes from the United States. And 
That's one thing a lot of farmers do while they're picking their corn is um, is validating uh, the hybrids that they've planted, um, seeing how they're doing. Uh, this stuff's really great and it helps out a lot. It um, numbers don't lie, but at the same time, there's a lot of you can't really replace uh, actually seeing what the hybrid's doing. It could yield really well, but say we had a hybrid out here that was starting to fall over um, and we know on our farm that we need it to stand longer we, we can be kind of thinking about that as far as you know what i don't want to take the risk on that hybrid next year falling over because if, if it's a hybrid with poor stock quality it ain't worth it for me on my farm um, because most of the time we got to leave it out here longer there's just scenarios that you run through your head and you kind of know what works and doesn't work on your farm so um, you can't replace, at least anyway on our farm, you can't replace uh, just being the ability to process it, you know, brain power. So what this does is validate what this is thinking. Um, so say we like this hybrid, we can uh, go through and say, yeah, the data actually shows it has worked well for us. And so it's kind of a two-fold system. We need the data to back up what we're thinking in our minds anyway on what's going to work. So you still can't, a lot of people, I hear it all the time, well, you're never going to have to run into your combine anymore. You're never going to want to, you're never going to have to operate with all this automation stuff anymore. And true, it's making it easier. Um, a lot of things like I'm not having to drive right now. I'm not having to worry about different things that are because they're becoming more automated. But at the same time, I still need to be out here with eyes seeing what these hybrids are doing and what is actually going on because you still can't take away that human processor out of the equation i don't think and so uh that's something i i still don't foresee taking the operator completely out of the cab for some time and you know i guess you could put video cameras and stuff but it's something about sitting out here feeling it living it it's hard to replace that and so I just, that's my point on seeing, like, I don't see the operator being removed, or at least not, maybe some of the cart cabs and stuff, but even then, there's a lot of ditches out here to navigate, and you'd have to have a buttload of sensors to basically uh, sense all that. So actually physically taking the operators out of the cab, I think is kind of a gimmick for the short term. Uh, maybe something long term down the road, but there's just something about that human element to make that decision. You know, our minds are a lot better than computers still are yet, so, so that's kind of uh, my thoughts on that. I'm, I'm on the other side the, of the, 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 the out here, the out here is that, that uh, the White House can say, well, at least we didn't kill NAFTA, at least we've still got the trade happening between the, the countries. Beautiful. shorts so sometime later we'll have to haul a few more wet corn bushel loads into that but they're closed today today's Saturday um, so we switched on over to soybeans and um, they got some green stems uh, so it kind of slows you down a bit but I'm actually kind of surprised how fast I'm able to go with the way they look I'm going about three and a half right now through them and it seems to be hammering and fine sometimes it can it depends on the bean it'll it can get you to a crawl almost but no we're gonna hammer away at these they're testing anywhere from well we haven't got a load back from the elevator but i think they're gonna be around that 12 to 13 range so the beans are ready the stems you know they're just green that's just the way it is so hopefully we can get a few beans out and 
we'll just keep harvesting uh, corn. We're, I mean, we still got a lot of corn that's wet. You know, we just had some early season that was ready to go. Uh, that's why we were hauling some of that off. So uh, we were testing some the other day, and it was up to the 33s, and we kind of picked in some bottoms, and it hit 35 percent. So um, we still got some pretty wet corn out there. So uh, it, I mean, harvest will be a little bit drawn out maybe it just depends on what kind of weather we have so I mean that's just the big kicker right there it's your first time viewing uh, we're O'Neill family farms there's three brothers uh, John me and my older brother Tom and then there's my father Steve or Steve dad so nope uh, welcome to the channel if uh, you haven't been welcome before so uh, hopefully you find these videos uh, somewhat informative on what we do out here in the farm also some Oh, commentary of maybe current issues on what's going on in the farming community. So we got some drizzle moving in. Starting to get a little crappy out, but we're almost done with this field. Hopefully we can get it done. Huskers are on. Hopefully they hold up well against Ohio State, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So go Big Red. See you guys. Thanks for watching.